Howard, and we're going to be talking about dealing with me, and how do we deal with who we are, and how God has created us, and, and we're all a little bit different, and we're all created differently, and we all interact differently, and we all have different personalities, and, and, and we all deal with our personalities in different ways, and today we're going to be talking about our personality, how do we deal with me, and how did God create me, and how do I allow God to continue to redeem me, and it's it's going to be, a, it's an interesting passage for me, an interesting thing for me, because it's not a sermon like I'm normally used to doing. Normally we like to do a series where we're just specifically working on an expository piece, and this time we're kind of looking at a variety of different scriptures and how God has used people, but there's no scripture that talks about specifically personality. There's a lot of scriptures that talk about personalities and the different personalities of people, but no one percent particular passage that talks about our personality, and yet it's a part of who God created us to be, and we want to have God in charge of that part of our life. Let me start off with reading several scriptures. Um, the first I'm going to be looking at is from Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 8. <clears throat> in this passage of scripture, Paul is talking to Titus, and he's describing to him how to work with various groups of people. So, Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 6. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. In everything, set them, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 starting with verse 11. And in this passage, Paul is talking to Timothy, and he's instructing him as he is preparing to go out and teach and preach and so forth. He says, Command and teach these things. Do not, look anyone do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to preach and to teach. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through the prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. And lastly, I'd like to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting with verse 12. And Paul here is writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he's closing this, this letter by speaking these words to them. So now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love, because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire, do not treat prophecies with contempt, test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless to the coming, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful and who will do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ be with you. People often say something like this. They'll say, I just want to be real. They want to find themselves and be real. The problem is when, they really find, when you really find yourself, you often don't like what you find. You may see that you are dictatorial, self-seeking, insecure, or critical, that God seems powerless in your life. The so-called real or natural you can be opposed to what God wants you to be. You should not seek to be normal, but spiritual. Not natural, but supernatural. To do what you do through the power of God in your life. To be what God wants you to be through the personal relationship with Him. By faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Ephesians 2 says that we should be conformed into the image of Christ. That comes from Uniquely You, a, a tool that we're using next week 
to do a personality profile with everybody. You're all invited to come next Sunday evening here to the church. We're going to offer this personality profile to help us understand who are we and how do we function and why do some things irritate me and why do some things energize me? Why do some people really, really annoy me? And why do some people make me feel really, really good? It has to do with our personality. Over the last weeks, we've talked about what are those things that I have a strong passion for. We've talked about how God has equipped us with the Holy Spirit. Those are all ways in where God is calling us to serve, but our personality talks about how we go about doing what it is that God calls us to do. And you can have two people that have the same gift, but a different personality, and things come across in a really, really different way. So to try to help you understand the uniqueness of how we're created, I want you to take a pen in your hand. Everybody grab a pen. If you don't have one, there's one in the bench in front of you. And if there's not, Michelle and Audrey will take care of that this week. Okay, so everybody got a pen? All right. If you're normally right-handed, put it in your left hand. If you're normally left-handed, put it in your right hand. And go to your notes and write your name with the opposite hand. Huh? Now, some of you, because of your personality type, you've already done something like this. You've already got it done. Okay, now put the pen in the other hand and write your name again. Now, it looks a lot better that time, doesn't it? When you write with the hand that your personality is there, it looks much, much different. And, and it's, it's, it's to help you understand that it's more natural writing with the right hand, whether it's your right hand or your left hand, whichever one is the right one for you, all right? So if you're left-handed, it's right to write with your left hand. And if you're right-handed, it's right to write with your right hand. Now, if you get enough of the rights there, you get the right thing, right? <laughs> How do you like that for a bunch of rights? Okay, now you get the idea. The bottom line is, is it's always more natural to do it one way than another way. It's the same way with our personality. We, we can have two different personalities, but, but we're all distinctly different ways. So if you think your personality doesn't matter, let me just do another little test with you, okay? How many of you think the toilet paper should come off the roll in the bathroom a certain way? Raise your hand. Why does it matter? It's toilet paper. I think it matters, okay? I'm one of those guys. Yes, Tyler, it's me, okay? Tyler's over there going, it doesn't matter. It's toilet paper. Dude, it does matter. It does its job a whole lot better if it came off the right, came off the right way. So, so if toilet paper doesn't come off the top of the roll, it's on the toilet paper thing wrong. Dude. This is not meant to be an amen time in the sermon, okay? <laughs> you guys are sick people when you say amen when I say something about toilet paper. <laughs> so, so the bottom line is we all have personality. Some of you thought that was really funny, and some of you are going, that was really gross, Glenn. That's because of your personality. Get used to it, baby. That's just how it is. You see, we all have a personality, and we all function in different ways. And we deal with it in different ways. And so we all have this idea of how things work. Some of you are extrovert. Some of you are introverts. I can identify with the extroverts. I know that's difficult, but I can. I can get there and I can understand how they can be outgoing. Then the introverts, they're going, you guys just talk all the time. You never, you know, my wife and I, we go somewhere together. I walk into the room. If there's 30 people, I walk into the middle of the room and I look around. I'm like, where am I going to start? And I can go around the room and I can talk to everybody. I'm going to find out a little bit of something about everybody. I can find out who their genealogy is. I find out who their grandparents were, their parents. I'm going to find some connection with them. I'm going to find some interest with them. And I can go around the room and my wife, she'll just go over to the corner. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And she'll look for someone that's all by themselves. And she'll talk to them. And on the way home, I'll be like, yeah, you know, there was people there. From, I'm talking about all these different people. And she's like, yeah, you know, this person, they had like this unique need. And she, she knows all about this one person. And that's about it. And she's very happy. And I leave. I know everybody. I know something about everybody. Where they went to school. What they do for work. Who their family is. What they like. What they don't like. Why they're weird. Why they're normal. You know, all that stuff. What's the difference? It's a difference in personality. Which one is the right one? Well, the right one is to be who God has called you to be. Redeemed by the Spirit of Christ. 
And when we understand who God has made us to be, we understand that we are different. So, so psychologists have determined that there are basically four different styles of personality. There are those dominant personalities, the ones that like to be in control. Uh, nobody has to ask a dominant person really what they think because they probably already told you. You never have to ask a dominant person what they're going to do next because they're telling you what they're going to do next. They, they are blunt, they're direct, they're fast to make judgments, and they're ready to take action. Let's get her done. I've met some of those people. There are those people that, for them, life is a party. Everywhere they go, it's just a party. These are the people people. They like to talk. They're very animated. They're, they like meeting new friends. Their nature is optimistic. They're fun to be around. They're like people magnets. People come to them and it's like, wow, everything great happens when you're around those people. Then there are those folks that are marked by their steadiness. They, they like situations that are dependable. They're predictable. They're not the rah, rah, rah type. They're the ones that will never be the life of the party, but they're really good listeners. They make other people feel very comfortable when you're around them. And then there's the detail people. These are the ones that like to do things right. They take care of the, the little things. They're, they're highly conscientious. Some people call them the perfectionists. Some of them are. But in reality, most of them just simply take pride in doing a job well and making sure that it's done well. So each of these personality types are valued, they're all necessary, and they're all important, and they're all a part of who we are. One of those descriptions I just gave pretty much kind of describes who you are. And in your mind, you're already trying to figure out which one I am. If you want to know, I'll be glad to tell you later. You see... We're all different, and God made us different because he has a job for each one of us. There's a beautiful story told about King Arthur. King Arthur had these four, these four servants or these four people that worked for him, these, these four knights, and they were sentenced to die at the guillotine because King Arthur believed that they had betrayed him. So they put these guys all at the guillotine, and somehow the, when the blade was ready to drop, they pulled the rope and the blade jammed up. King Arthur felt guilty for trying to kill these guys with the guillotine for, for their betrayal. And so he said, okay, the guillotine didn't work. It's God's way of saying you guys should all live. And he let them all walk away. The knight that has a high dominant personality, he comes away from that and he says, I told you, I told you I was innocent. That execution should have never been planned for in the first place. And he let everybody know. The next guy, the knight was primarily a per people person. He said, we're free. We're free. Oh, hallelujah, we're free. Let's go have a party. The third guy, he's more of a uh, steady guy. And he was counseling the executioner saying, look, man, I know you're just doing your job. You're doing what you have to do. I know you don't want to do this, but it's okay if you pull the rope. It's fine. And he's consoling the executioner. And the last guy... The guy that's much more of a detail-oriented person, he's standing there looking at the guillotine, and he goes, I know what happened. I know how we can fix this thing to make it work right the next time. Now, we need all of these people, but each of these are four distinct different styles. And I'll let you decide as we go on today, and if you come to our class next week, our workshop in the evening, you're going to learn more about yourself. But you're going to discover that what's really important is, it's important for us to know who we are, because who we are and how we interact with other people denotes how they respond to us, denotes how well God can use us in various situations, but also when we know what it is that makes me frustrated when I'm around certain groups of people, when I know what gives me energy, then I can plan my schedule and work around that as well so that I can maximize my strengths and minimize my weaknesses. Coach McCarthy, one of the, the guy that started Promise Keepers, he wrote a book called Blind Spots. It's one of my favorite books. Coach McCarthy, he talks about, he says, in football, the toughest position to play in football is left guard and left tackle. You know why? Most quarterbacks are right-handed, and they stand in the pocket like this, and they can't see what's on the left side. And he said, it's so difficult to have a left guard and a left tackle that know how to block so the quarterback is protected in the pocket, and they're not hit on their blind sides. And then he goes on to say in his book, he says, and we all have blind spots. And we need people around us to help us fill in those blind spots so we're not hit on the blind side and taken out. 
And in our life, when we begin to understand our personality, we understand those positive traits of us. You know, we all have the, the push-pull side of us, right? So we all have those pieces that, like, oh, make you want to come in. And there's other pieces that can, like, draw you off, draw you away and make you back off. We all have that. And if you don't think you do, then you just demonstrated one of them. You see, we all have that part, and we have to understand who we are and how God created us, not to make an excuse, but so that we can work at strengthening who God has made us, and we can minimize those deficiencies that pull us away from what God wants to use us to do. A number of years ago, I had this young man that I worked with, and, and he, used his excuse, he used his personality as an excuse for everything. You could never talk to him about anything. So if I'd say something to him, he'd say, well, if you don't like it, then you have to take it up with God. I'm just doing what God told me to do. And then if I would say something else or someone else would talk to me, he'd be like, that's how God made me. So if you don't like how God made me, then talk to God. I can't change how God made me. No, you can't change how God made you, but you can change how you live in the who that God has made you to be. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at the different ways of how we function. You see, God has shaped each one of us for ministry. God has prepared each one of us for a task. A number of years ago, there was a man by the name of Antonio Stradivari. He, he was a guy that could never imagine that God would give anybody any kind of abilities. He would sit on a park bench with his friends, and, and he would talk with his friends, and all that Antonio wanted to do was carve with the knife. He would carve day in and day out, and he would always carve. His friends were always talking and bubbly, interacting with other people, and Antonio would always carve, and his friends thought that he was really kind of a weird guy. One day he heard about in his little town in Italy where he lived that there was the finest violin maker in the world, and this, this, this guy had stopped and actually talked to those, these four boys, and they said, you know who that is? And, and Antonio's like, no, I don't. And they said, he's the best violin maker in world all of Italy and maybe the world. So Antonio went over to his place a couple of weeks later and he said, I don't know anything about music. I, I can't sing anything. I can't play anything, but I love to carve. And Antonio started to work with this guy and he worked with him and worked with him. This guy taught him everything he knew. Antonio could not play an instrument, but he loved to carve. And at one time he spent a year on one violin. Today, if you buy a Stradivarius violin, it's the greatest violin in the world. They sell for millions of dollars. What's the difference? Antonio knew that his personality was such that God created him that he could sit in the corner of a workshop and carve on a violin for a year. Not me! There's not a chance I'm carving on a violin for one year. Dude, it ain't going to happen for one month. That ain't how God wired me. And you know what? God made us both different. So let's talk about how he made us and how he's changed us. So there is, there is the people that are the dominant, directing, driving, demanding, determined, decisive, doing people. These are the people that are get or done kind of people, but they are the people that... People don't really matter so much to always. They, they are the ones that are, they're sometimes known as lions or clerics. These are the ones that are, their, their basic motivation is a challenge or to be in control of something. They, they need to learn that we need people in the process. These are people that need to learn that relaxation is okay. It's fine if you sit on a rocking chair once in a while or even on the couch and drink an iced tea. It's okay to do that. They, these are people that need to understand that, that some controls are needed, but not all people have to be controlled. Self-control is most important. They need to understand that. They need to, they need to understand that it's, a, it's important to focus on finishing well. Paul was this kind of a guy. Paul in the Bible, the one we read about in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Paul was a guy that was very much a, a demanding. He was a D personality. We're going to talk about this more next week, but he was a D personality. He was a guy that could focus on a task and he could just get it done. So, so he was a guy with his dominant personality. He could walk into a town and he could preach a message of hope and salvation and he could preach to the people. And at the end of his sermon, they would take him outside the town and they would stone him because he was so forthright. And when they get done stoning him, he would give up off the ground and he'd be like, oh man, that hurt. And he'd walk back into town and he'd say, you know, you stoned me because of my love for Jesus Christ. I wasn't quite done telling you about it. And so I'm going to tell you some more. He didn't care. 
He was that kind of a guy. Another person that was a dominant person like that, a D personality, was Sarah. Sarah and Abraham, you know, you, we oftentimes think of Sarah as being this fine little docile lady dude. She wasn't very that way at all. She was the one who went to her husband Abraham and said, okay, Abraham, listen. God promises a son, it ain't happening. So let's make it happen. So you take my handmaid, my, my, my servant girl, Hagar. I want you to take her. You're going to have a relationship with her. You're going to have a baby. And we're going to make this happen. If God's going to take forever, we're going to make it happen. And if you follow along, you know the rest of the story. The rest of the story is, is Hagar had Ishmael. And then later God said, you know, you didn't listen to me, but I wanted to have a child through you and Sarah. And so Sarah had a child, and that child's name was Isaac. And now we have this world war that's still going on today, the battle between Ishmael. Ishmael's descendants and the battle between Isaac's descendants. Sarah was one of those strong, dominant personalities. And, and again, we need these kind of people. These are people that can make things happen. These are the people that can look at a little rubble on the ground and they can make a big, tall mountain be moved away and they can build big buildings and they can build skyscrapers and they can mobilize people and they can get it happen. The problem with deep personalities is they can go from point A to point B and there can be a whole army of people laying in the rubble. They run over them all. There are the cautious competent, calculating, compliant, careful, contemplative type of people. These are people that are much more melancholy or the beaver personality. These are ones that are more concerned about quality and correctness. They desire clearly divine tasks. They, they're very concerned about details. They, they limit their risks. They're not risk takers at all. They just, they really watch what they do. The, the assignments are required, require precision and planning. They need time to think. These are people that, that are not the quick movers. They're not the quick reactors. They're the ones that are slow and steady and they get there. Takes them a while to get there, but when they get there, they've crossed every T, they've dotted every I, they've got every period in the right place, they've got the commas in the right place. They know all the details and it's taken care of. They need to learn that total support is not always possible. They need to learn through explanation that ex through explanation or exp that not everything is going to happen the way. That they need to understand that de deadlines need to be met. They need to be much more optimistic. They can't be so, so low on optimism. Thomas was one of these guys. One of Jesus' disciples, Thomas. Thomas was a guy that looked at Jesus and he said, Oh, Jesus, I'll believe that you have resurrected from the dead. When I put my hand in your sides and I touch your body and I know you're alive, then I'll believe it. But until then, you've got to show me. Thomas was not a guy that seemed to inspire a lot of people. In fact, we still call him old Doubting Thomas, right? But we need people like Doubting Thomas. We need people like that around because they can help us ask questions and they can learn, help us learn and grow from that. And we need those kinds of persons. We also have someone that was like Esther. Esther was in the, the court of the king. You know, she was right there and her husband came out to her and said, you know, Esther, maybe God created you for a time like this. You need to go in and meet with the king and tell the king that these are your people. Don't put them all to death. And Esther's like, well, what if I go in there and he kills me? What if I go in there and he puts me to death because I wasn't invited? He's like, just go. You might save a whole people. You might lose your life. That's one. You might save a couple million. Which do you want to do, Esther? Now get in there. And, and she went. But it's again, it's understanding who we are. Another group of people. They're the inspiring, influencing, inducing, impressive, interactive, interested in people kind of persons. These are the ones that are like... Uh, they're known as segwins. They are, they are people that, that, that they're best motivated by recognition and approval. They desire prestige. They desire to be friendly in relationships. They want freedom from details. They want opportunities to help others. They want opportunities to motivate others. They, they want a chance to verbalize ideas. These people are the people that, that, these are the people people, you know. You're around these people and you say, oh yeah, they're the people people. They need to learn that time must be managed. Deadlines are very important. They, they got to realize that, that too much optimism can be dangerous. Being responsible is more important than being popular. They need to learn that listening better will improve one's influence. Peter was one of these guys. You know, Peter, he was a guy that stood there downtown when Jesus was being crucified. And he goes, I don't know that guy. No, no, I don't know him. And then it wasn't just too far later, you go into scriptures. If you get to Acts chapter 2, we read about Peter preaching the sermon. And 3,000 people come to know Jesus. Bam, just like that. It was Peter that Jesus says, so who do people say that I am? And they said, well, you know, the people are saying that you're maybe, 
you know, the Son of God, I don't know. And then Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church. Peter was a very outgoing personality. He was up and he was down and everywhere in between and he was moving. Not only was Peter like that, but we also have Ruth as being like that. You know Ruth and Boaz? Ruth, the little lady that needed a husband, <coughs> and she wanted a husband, and she knew that Boaz was able to redeem her, and so she went over to the threshing floor, and she met him, and she did all, you know, she dated him. She was doing the dating, and she told Boaz, you know, you, you need to check me out because I'm, your, I'm the one you can redeem, and I can be your spouse, and if you read the rest of the story, you know they got married. But she was outgoing. She was, she was willing to take a risk. She went to the threshing floor when she probably wasn't supposed to, but she went and she took a risk and it worked. She got herself a husband. It, it was a good deal for them. So then we have the S behaviors. These are the ones that are steady. They're stable. They are shy. They're security oriented. They're servants. They're submissive. They're specialists. These are the people that are the ones that are kind of hold back, but they're really, really good. They, they have a lot of support. It, th these are people that, that desire an area of, of a specialization. They, they identify with the group. They work to establish patterns with people. They, they are very, they're much, very secure in situations. They're consistent in familiar environments. They're not risk takers at all. They're the people that hold back and God uses in powerful ways. One of them, one of them a good example in the Bible that is from this personality type is Moses. And we talked about him last week. Moses was a guy that God spoke to him out of a bush. It's like, dude, Moses, how much more does God have to do? So God spoke to him out of a bush. God showed him how he could turn his hand into leprosy and take it back. His staff turned into a sick. God did all this stuff. And at the end, Moses goes, you know, God, I'm not a very good speaker, and I can't do very much. And I'm just pretty sure I can't go. You've got to use someone else, God. I'm just not the right guy. And God said, stop it. And God used Moses. And the reason Moses was so effective... It's because when God said, now Moses, when we're out there in the wilderness and we're going along, when the cloud is in the tent, you stay here. And when the cloud starts moving, you follow. But you just go when it goes and you stay when it stays. Some of us would have a hard time with that. Some of us would have a hard time waiting. We'd be like, okay, God, if you don't want to go, we're going to go. Catch up. But Moses wasn't that way. Moses was the guy that said, if God's not moving, we ain't moving, folks. He waited. And he waited, and he let God be in charge, and God does fantastic work when he's in charge. We need Moseses. Not only was Moses a person like this, but Hannah was like that. Hannah waited and waited and waited on a child, and she prayed and dedicated it to God. And when the child finally came, when it was old enough to wean, she took it back to the temple and gave it to God and said, God, there's your child. Wow. That, that's like, I, I, I would have a hard time with that. But Hannah was that kind of a stability. And for all of us, each of us is created differently. We're created differently, and it's for a purpose. And so let me try and bring this back together and kind of wrap this up for you, because you're thinking already, okay, Glenn, let's get out of here at some point in time. <clears throat> so there is the outgoing person and the introverted person. When you walk into a room full of strangers, what's your natural tendency? Are you outgoing or are you introvert? Let me give you a little example of this, okay? I'm, I'm more outgoing than Brad. And those of you that know Brad well, you think that Brad's probably pretty outgoing, but Brad's a shy guy by nature. In fact, by nature, Brad, he said, Brad will tell you if you talk to him, he says, in my first pastor, one of the struggles I had is I was so shy, I didn't want to do anything. So, so Brad is now functioning as a pastor, as an introvert. I function as a pastor, as an extrovert. I, I'm the optimist. Brad's not quite as optimistic as what I am. I, I don't see any small details ever. I, I just struggle with three small details. I mean, you know, why, why look at the, I mean, why do they put speedometers so small in cars, you know? It ought to be a big deal. But I'm not a small, I'm not a details guy. So I need people around me that have the little the details all in place. Brad does that. When Brad and I talk about doing something, Brad talks about all the little details. I'm like, oh, Brad, did you think about this? I'm talking about all the big things. I'm taking big brush strokes across the sky. And Brad, he's talking about putting a bird in the sky. I'm, I'm thinking about a horizon. And Brad's talking about a flower. Which one of us is most important? Both of us. We need each other very much.
And we need each other because we work together. One is introvert, one is extrovert. And it's both right when it's submitted to the will of God. Peter was that guy, as I talked about, he was the guy that said, I will do anything for you, Jesus. I will lay down my life for you. He denied him, and he came back and preached a sermon where thousands came to know Christ. As we function in a way that God calls us to, we need to remember that it's not that we can't do the opposite, it's just not natural. So when you see Brad and you meet him in the foyer, when you see him on a Sunday morning up here, Brad will talk and visit and with, interact with anybody. It's not his natural style. He can do the opposite. Why? Because God did not call us to do the natural. He called us to do the supernatural. God's not calling you to be who you are by birth. He's calling you to be who you are by indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And when we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, amazing things happen. There's also those people that are task-oriented versus those people that are people-oriented. So let me give you an example of that. So I've, I've been on a number of mission trips. So you go on a mission trip and you have all these people along, right? So I'm in Costa Rica one time and we're building a church house. I'm a more task-oriented guy, okay? I'm like, give me a job to do, I'm going to get it done. My wife doesn't make lists anymore. She quit making lists for me because she said, I want you to sleep once in a while. If I make a list, you won't sleep until that list is done. It doesn't work very good for us. We, we like to be together once in a while, so we've realized the list doesn't work. She'll tell me once in a while what she wants done, but we leave it at that. So we're in Costa Rica, and, and Mose is sitting over here. He's talking with everybody. I'm like, Mose, if you just get over here and work, we can get this church house built. You know, the task-oriented people, they get stuff done. And, and we need task-oriented people. They can, they can get their eyes focused on a target, and they can get there and get it done. The problem is, is this littering of people along the way from here to there because they run over everybody in the process. The people people, they're over here, and they're talking to people, and they're interacting with people, and they're making, you know, they're hearing the hurts and the, say, the stories, and the task people, they're getting it done. Which one is important? We need both of them. So when we get done, you know, I, I preached a bunch of sermons and had a great time down there and interacted with people, and, and God used me in a powerful way. And, and it was Mose and it was Earl that found out about the prophecy that God gave one of the villagers. He said, you know, he said, in six months from now, in the middle of the rainy season, it's going to be really dry, and God's going to be doing a work in your midst. It's not going to rain. We went down there in the middle of the rainy season, six months after his vision, and it didn't rain for 10 days in the rainforest. I didn't hear that story because I was busy building a church. I was busy getting ready for a sermon. Earl and Mose, they heard all the details. Every one of them. And you know which guy they remember probably today? Earl and Mose. You see, we have to work together. I, I don't do what Merle, Mose and Earl do. And they don't do what I do. But together, we make quite a team. Brad and I, we work together. We make quite a team. Mary and Martha, they're the best biblical example of this. So, so you have Mary and Martha. Jesus, their, their, their brother dies, and Jesus comes to raise their brother from the dead. And one of them is screwing around making sure everybody's got food to eat and water to drink and stuff to drink. And the other one just comes and sits at the feet of Jesus going, oh, You're here, Master. If you'd have came just quicker, our brother would have lived. It's so awesome that you're... And they're just worshiping the fact that Jesus is there. Now, which one was which? Mary just sat there at the feet of Jesus, and she said, Wow. It's so amazing to be in your presence. Then, then her sister Martha's running around, making sure everybody's fed and taking care of it. And she goes to Jesus, don't you see what my sister is doing? She's just sitting at your feet. Can't you tell her to get up and help me get stuff ready for all these people? And Jesus said, uh, no. I think she's doing just fine. And so are you. You see, we all are created differently. And we have to live in different ways. Which sister was the most effective? You see, it's better to be Jesus-oriented than oriented in any other way. And when we're oriented around Jesus, it is then that we begin to function in the way that he has created us. But here's what's important. When I understand how I function, I understand my natural reaction. So let me ask you this. When a little kid starts screaming, does the hair on the back of your neck go straight up and you go, ah! that ever happen? If it does, you should not be involved in children's ministry. <laughs> it's not a part of your personality. There's other people that when they hear the little kids screaming, they go, oh, I wonder if they're hurting. I wonder if they're sick. 
and they got all this empathy, and they're wanting to go find out who it is and how they can help. I bet mom's having a rough day. Oh, I should just go and help them. That's a difference in personality, and God wants to use you. We have to work together, and we have to understand that God wants to redeem us. There are the people that like variety and the people that like routine. Those that like routine, like they get up in the morning, and it's like they're so boring. They get up, they take five steps, they go to the toilet. They get out of the toilet, they take two steps, they go to the, to the sink. They wash their hands, they do whatever, they brush their teeth, they go to the shower. Everything's the same. The, the cup of coffee is step number eight in their morning routine. Nothing ever changes. They get up at the exact same time every day, they do the exact same things. They come home, they do the exact same thing. I'll bet your shoes are always in the same spot every night. Hello? You know, it doesn't really matter. It's okay. We need people like that. And then there's a the variety of people. They get up, they might do the same thing, they might not. They don't even always remember where they're at, where they're going. <laughs> the story is told of, uh, of a very well-known person that did a lot of great inventing, Mr. Einstein. He was on a train, and the conductor came along and asked Mr. Einstein for his ticket, and he said, oh, I don't know where it's at. And he started looking, and, and, the, and the conductor says, oh, it's okay, Mr. Einstein, we know who you are, just, just you're fine. And the conductor left and came back 45 minutes later, and Mr. Einstein was still looking for his ticket. And the conductor said, Mr. Einstein, it's okay. We all know who you are. It's okay. And he goes, no, I need my ticket because I don't even know where I'm going. <laughs> you see, we need people to work together. We need people to work with us to help create us to be who God wants us to be. So let me bring this to a close from 1 Peter chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn to it. If you don't have your Bibles, look at the one sitting beside you because they do. 1 Peter chapter 4, starting with verse 7. By the way, Paul was a variety guy. Paul was a variety guy, and he just went through life living variety. Went from town to town, village to village, stoned, unstoned, I mean, getting stoned, not being stoned, uh, I guess it is weed week, isn't it? I'm not talking about weed, okay? But he, he got stoned, he got beat for his faith, and he just kept right on doing it. Then you have the shepherds that got up every day and tended the sheep, and it was the shepherds that the angels came to to say that Jesus had just arrived, right? So in 1 Peter, 1 Peter is bringing things back together, and he's closing this up. This is what he says. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-control so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. What do we do with our personality? How do we deal with it? Well, first of all, accept who you are. Because God made you that way for a reason. It's not an excuse. It's an opportunity. You can strengthen your weakness, or you can build on your weakness, whichever you want to do. But God wants you to just recognize this. There's some, some key things he gives in this passage to tell us what to do with ourselves. First of all, live life recognized that the end of time is near. There's not a person sitting here today that is guaranteed tonight. Not a one of us. Last evening, there was an accident on 66 and 20A. Two helicopters and six squads. Nobody knows. And Paul, Peter is writing to the people, and he's writing to us today to say, look, the end of all things is near. So there's two things I want you to do because the end of all things is near. Number one, be clear-minded. We live in a time and a day and age when people are under the influence of alcohol and drugs and all kinds of other stuff, pornography, and it's destroying who we are and we're not clear-minded. To be clear-minded means I'm not infiltrating and polluting myself with all these externals and I'm listening to the voice of God. And when I'm listening to the voice of God, it is then that I can be who God wants me to be in my greatest form. So he says, be clear-minded. And secondly, he says, be self-control. Don't be under the influence of all this other stuff. 
It breaks my heart when I hear people talk about, oh, I was out partying and it was just the greatest thing, man. I don't remember what I did. That's awful. I'll be honest with you. It's terrible. Because if you don't know what you did, what did you do that glorified God? Recently, there was a, a case uh, on the internet that talked about this young man that was at a college a college student that was caught raping a girl. The girl was passed out. He was in the, in, the, in the grounds of the campus. He was underneath a tree somewhere raping this girl when he was caught. They hauled him off to jail, and the whole time he's saying, it was consensual, it was consensual. She's completely passed out. And he's like, I was just sure it was consensual, but he didn't know because he was under the influence of alcohol. He didn't have a clue. It happens all the time, folks. And we allow ourselves to get under the control of a lot of things, not just drugs, not just alcohol or pornography. You can talk about it. It can even be work. It can be anything. When we're not under the control of God, it's out of control. He says, be clear-minded and self-controlled. The second thing he tells us is pray. If you're not on a habit of praying, you're missing out on all the power in your life. Because God gives us a Holy Spirit, and, and we pray and we interact and allow the Holy Spirit to be in control of our life. Paul says it this way. He says, pray continually. Pray always. Pray continually. Never stop praying. And it's so important for us to be praying because it gets us in tune with the Spirit of God. The third thing he tells us, he says, is love each other deeply. Okay? It's so easy for us to love each other as an emotion. You make me feel good, so I'll love you. You make me feel bad, I'm not going to be around you. He says, love each other deeply. And then he says this, because love covers a multitude of sins. In other words, you're a jerk sometimes, and so is your friends a jerk sometimes. And they do dumb things, they do stupid things, and love covers that when you love them deeply. And it's a love that comes from God, an agape type of love, unconditional love. So he says, we're called to love each other deeply. The third thing, he, or the fourth thing he tells us, he says is offer hospitality. Notice he doesn't, in this case, he doesn't use hospitality as a spiritual gift. If it's your spiritual gift to be hospitable, then when you're around somebody, be hospitable to them. But he says, everybody, be hospitable. Then he says it this way. He says, without grumbling. Oh, I, had, I had Neil and Jamie over for supper and... Such a chore. I mean, I was working all day, and I didn't want to have him over, but I had to because God told me I have to have him over. But it's like, oh, that's horrible, right? He says, be hospitable, interact with people, and do it without grumbling. God, thank you for giving me the opportunity to interact with these people today. It's really cool. And it, he's talking about it in the matter-of-fact sense because it's not an option. It's just like one of the other commissions. It's a commission. Be hospitable if you want to. That's how we add it. But he says, just be hospitable. The next thing he tells us, he says, use whatever gifts you have been given. Why? To serve others. He doesn't say, use whatever gift you have given for your own advantage. No. Use whatever gifts you have been given from God as a way to serve other people. You realize when God calls us to serve and we do serve other people, it changes our focus. When I'm serving someone else, I forget all the things that I want for myself because it's a blessing to serve others. Then he goes on, he says this, and when you speak, remember that you are speaking the very words of God himself. Now, wouldn't that change everything? I might add it this way. Now, that was in the scripture. I might add this. The things you post on social media might reflect your heart. It's amazing to me what people put on social media. And then when you meet them, they're like this docile, mild little person. I'm like, what the world? You know? People, like, people post stuff on social media and they wonder why teachers and parents get frustrated. They wonder why bosses want to unemploy them. It's like, you're not very smart, that's why. The reality is, is we put this stuff online and we wonder why people read it. <laughs> or we know they're going to read it and we wonder why they take it to heart. You see, Paul is telling us here, when we speak, he's not just talking about literally the verbal words. He says, when you put something out there, make sure you're putting it out there as though it's the very words of God himself. Because how you convey the message to people denotes how people respond to who you are. And he says, we do all this to the glory of and the praise of God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you. I would encourage you guys as you live your life and as you function, that you recognize that you are, as Paul says, you are Christ's ambassadors. I am Christ's ambassador. Everywhere I go, everything I say, 
everything I do is on behalf of Christ living in me. I can say what I want, but people still know. And so I would encourage you in this coming week to be aware that your personality is a gift from God, not a curse. Human nature will take it the wrong way, but God has died on the cross through Jesus Christ to redeem us. And a surrendered, redeemed person is amazing. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for who you created us to be. For how you created us to be. And the fact, God, that you knew us before we were ever born and you had a plan for us to live. God, I pray that you will just help us to live that out in a way that reflects you. God, help us to understand our personalities not as a way of excusing ourselves, but as a way of understanding so we can become more like you in every way. May your kingdom come in our life and your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.